your photos. So what am I actually looking at? Well, the aurora is caused by charged particles, so that's protons and electrons coming from the sun. So the particles are in the solar wind stream, and as they approach the Earth, they're actually channeled down our magnetic field lines to the North and the South Poles, mm -hmm. and the, the particles collide with atoms in the upper atmosphere, and that's what creates the auroras that we see. So when you see the auroras dancing, you're actually seeing our magnetic field lines flowing, illuminated. Wow. So do I have to go to the North Pole to see the aurora? You don't have to go to the North Pole. The oral oval is actually south of the poles. It's like a ring that, that's slightly away. So in the Northern Hemisphere, it's around 65 to 75 degrees latitude. And if you're in North America, you'd want to go to Northern Canada, Alaska. Um, in Europe, you'd go to Scandinavia, like Northern Norway, Northern Sweden, Northern Finland, or Iceland. Um, so. If the aurora is really strong, it actually starts to move south. The ring gets bigger and goes down to more southern latitudes, but that's not as common as we might wish. In the southern hemisphere, it's a little bit harder. You can see why here on this map. It's not really a lot of land around the, um, that latitude. So Tromsø in uh, northern Norway is great, uh, the Lofoten Islands. In um, Sweden we've got Kiruna where the ice hotel is and, uh, and even in northern Finland there's great cities. A lot of the places where you can stay up here um, offer fabulous warm weather gear that you can put over more warm weather gear and stay warm but basically anywhere you'll go to see the northern lights is cold and you need to be prepared for that long cold nights out in the snow. Having a good guide who can help you get around, who's willing to find a great place, a clearing in the clouds or, or a good scenic um, picturesque landscape to help you take the pictures um, is actually really great. So what's this number? Well that's the KP index. Um, it's actually it measures the strength of the aurora. So normally you can see it's in the 0 to 2 range. Um, this is spaceweather.com and it's a really great informative website and it gives you a 24 hour forecast for the KP index here. The higher that number the better the auroras, and the further south that the auroral ring will radiate. Um, so uh, you can actually get alerts sent to your phone and choose a certain number of the KT KP index. Okay, so I can just w wait for them to get to a 9 and then I'll definitely see them down there. <laughs> Not really, because remember they're usually less than 3 and occasionally 5 to 6. Okay. Um, I mean, like our alerts are set for of over four, mm -hmm. and if you waited for a nine, you might never get one. Right. <laughs> okay, so how do I know when it's going to be high if this only gives a 24-hour prediction? Well, there's, you might be able to give a few days extra notice. There's certain events um, on the sun that can allow you to predict a strong aurora a few days in advance. The best option is a coronal mass ejection, which is a CME, and this is when a huge amount of matter and energy is blasted out of the sun into space. And if that comes to Earth, then it, auroras will be spectacular. Um, the next one to look for is a coronal hole. So the coronas, like it's like the upper atmosphere of the sun, and the less dense areas of that are called a coronal hole. And these allow fast moving solar winds underneath to escape out into space, and that can also lead to really great auroras. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing you can look for is the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field. So if you just look here for the VZ value, the auroras are going to be stronger when it's pointing south. You mean the VZ value? No, I mean the VZ <laughs> value. I mean, lastly, do you know, without a CME or even a coronal hole, uh, the solar wind speed can vary, and normally it's like under 400 kilometers a second, um, but if it goes higher than that, then that can also really have great auroras. Okay, displays. so so head north if I see a CME, a coronal hole, or a fast solar wind stream. Is that right? Yeah, okay. totally, yeah. I mean, you can still see the aurora without those, but it might be less strong, less intense and shorter duration. I really love this photo, it's beautiful, but is this what I would actually be seeing if I was there with my own eyes? Well, it depends on the strength of the aurora. You know, photos are taken with really long exposures, which our eyes can't do. So, you know, a really weak aurora is actually going to be more colorful mm -hmm. on a photograph, but a strong aurora can actually look really bright and colorful and amazing with the naked eye. Wow. And what causes those colors? 
Well, different colors of light are actually photons vibrating, uh, vibrating at different frequencies. So the different atoms in our atmosphere get excited by the solar wind stream particles. Mm -hmm. And that means that their electrons are actually jumping up to higher energies. And when they fall back down, they're emitting photons, which is actually the light that we see as the aurora. So, you know, it's usually green, and that's from oxygen atoms that are excited. Um, but oxygen can also emit red. And these purples would be from nitrogen. Um, you know, so a camera can actually integrate the photons, but our eyes, not so much. And that's why you can sometimes get a, a photograph with, mm. with brighter colors than we can see. Okay. You know. All right, so I want to make a really good photo. Um, so what do I need to do? Well, first and foremost, you need a tripod. Absolutely need a tripod because you're going to need longer exposure times and you can't stand still for that long. The second thing you need is a camera that allows you to change settings manually. You're going to need to change your ISO settings, your f-stop settings, and your exposure time. So with the ISO settings, uh, you'll want something in a range between maybe 800 up to 3000. Um, you basically want a higher number than normal. The higher that number goes though, the pictures can get a bit grainy, so you need a really good camera if you're up at the 3000 range. Um, we've seen some pictures that you can go as low as 400 on your ISO, but you've got to have really strong northern lights for that. So somewhere around 800 to 3000, okay? Your f-stop, you need a lower number, right? That needs to be a low number. So f1.4 is amazing, f2.8 is fabulous, um, but lenses that go to those numbers tend to be quite expensive. So you might find you can only get f4 point something or 5 point something. So that means you'll just need a longer exposure or a higher ISO to compensate for that. Um, generally, um, you'll want also a wide angle um, just so you can get a nice wide view. Um, the next thing is your exposure times. So, with the exposure times, you'll need probably about 10 to 30 seconds. Um, but if the auroras are really strong, you could do something in two and a half seconds even. You know, it really just depends on how much light is coming from the aurora. If it's faint and diffuse, and you're in the middle of a completely dark area with no lighting around you at all, you're going to need a longer exposure time, up to 30 seconds, possibly even more. Now, the longer you do your exposure time, the blurrier things get, the more of a wash you'll get of the, the greenness of those lights. Um, so shorter times are going to look a little bit sharper, um, but it all depends on how much light you can get into that camera. So really strong northern lights um, with perhaps a little bit of, of landscape around and you'll do great. You know people were using their flashes so I was walking miles away from them like you're not going to get anything with that and flash. it distresses me because you can imagine them months later like looking through show, trying to show family members and they're like what? And There's you some spent snow. all that money. And then There's you some even... snow. And yeah. <laughs> some snow, because all you get is the foreground, right? Foreground. Yeah, so everybody uses the flash. Um, but yeah, that's the whole point. People just don't know. Mm. So, okay, so what about video? Well, most video cap cameras won't capture the aurora very well. You know, still photos are taken with long exposures, right? But most video cameras are taking like 24 frames per second. Like a professional camera with a really um, full frame sensor, a big sensor, those are going to do well. Um, there are some commercial camcorders that can actually handle it. Um, what we found is really the best thing is to actually adjust the shutter speed. If you take it down, then you can let more light into the camera and, and get something. So here, um, you know, as a matter of fact, you're going to want software that can actually adjust the saturation even then. Um, but this is what our consumer camcorder footage looked like when we first put it into the computer. And this is what it looks like after we've increased the saturation or corrected it in a program. You can use like Color or DaVinci Resolve. Um, but, of course, more saturation means more noise, so you have to be careful about that. Um, but for still and for video cameras, remember that batteries lose their power really quickly in cold temperatures. So you've got to take spare batteries. Okay. So I need to head up north with a tripod, a really good camera with manual controls and warm clothes. Yes. And I need to go when there's a CME about to hit the earth and or a coronal hole or a fast solar wind. Totally. But what if I can't actually go on short notice? 
question. So if you can't book a trip on short notice, then you just have to take a chance and book something. Um, maximize your chances by booking at least a few days so that you've got several nights to choose whether there's cloudy skies or if it's happening or if it's stronger. Um, the equinoxes tend to be t a time when the uh, aurora is actually stronger. Um, and the good thing about that is it's not quite as cold um, because they're, they're a little bit outside of the strongest winter months. The, the aurora can come and go though. It can come for like, uh, a 10 minute amazing show and then it'll die down and then an hour later or two hours later or even 10 minutes later you might get this amazing spectacular show that's completely different than the last one you just saw so you just have to stick with it and wait it out but if it's cloudy you won't see anything right that's right and also a weak aurora can be drowned out by a full moon so you need to check your full moon calendar Another way to see the aurora is to take a northern lights flight. This is where they take you up in a plane and they fly towards the auroral oval. They circle around a few times and then they fly back. There's a few disadvantages in that you might spend two thirds of the flight just getting there and back. When you get there, only half the plane can actually see the aurora at one time. And if you have a three by three configuration in the plane, you'll spend a lot of that time shuffling between people so everyone has a chance to look out the window, which means that your actual viewing time watching the aurora, if there is one, is actually quite limited. But the advantages is that it's up above the clouds, they dim the cabin lights so that you can see perfectly out the windows, and you don't have to stand out in the freezing cold. So if there's an aurora, it's really awesome. But you really don't even have to book the Northern Lights flight. If you're flying on any commercial flight in Northern Latitudes at night, you might get a chance to see it. If you're booking or you're flying west, book a window seat on the right side of the plane. And if you're flying east, book a window seat on the left side of the plane. They dim the lights at night anyway, so there's a chance that you'll actually get a really good show. And isn't there some decade-long cycle? Yeah, it's roughly 11 years. And it's peaking now, right? It's actually an estimate, but NASA thinks that the end of 2013 will be the peak of the solar sun cycle. So some people think it's already peaked, some people think it's peaked for one hemisphere of the sun and that the other hemisphere of the sun is going to peak in 2014. But either way, your best bet is going to be to take a look at the northern lights in the next year or two, otherwise you might have to wait to the next cycle. Now even in the, in the bottom of this cycle, you can still get auroras, they're just not as frequent and perhaps not as strong. Virgin Galactic are planning commercial flights to see the aurora from space right here from the Ice Hotel in Kiruna in Sweden. But at the moment the price is about $200,000 a person and it's going to be a few years before they're ready to go. When we went to Sweden it was completely covered in clouds. Um, actually for many, many miles, hundreds really? of miles. Um, so we actually got in the car and we drove to Finland from Sweden. Like, wow. no one else at the hotel got to see the lights that night, but we were willing to drive quite a few hours, and we got the most amazing footage because there was a CME the few days before, um, or it might even have been the day before with a really fast um, mm. wind speed. Uh, but anyway, and it was so worth the drive. And it was spectacular. And you found that out because you you checked beforehand on the website. Yeah. Well, we just well we knew that there was a CME from spaceweather.com. Okay. And then we checked uh, radar just to see where the cloud cover was, and we picked a city that was outside of the cloud cover. Gosh. So it's really worth doing that extra bit of research then. See. So oh yeah, it was worth it. Actually, oh, some of that research was calling Ben, and Ben was calling the airports for us. No way. He seriously was calling the airports to get the weather reports oh for that God. night to see what cloud cover they expected. Wow, well, so if you go all that way, you may done. as well hunt it down. Yeah, it exactly. Makes it more exciting as well. Totally. And maybe cool. next year you'll come to Sweden with us and see the I think that sounds like a great plan. Let's do it. Yay!